to Open Rooms 11 um, on the corners of Argyll and Glenwood photo book in collaboration. Um, so I'm Sorha, I work at Open Eye Gallery and tonight we're joined by Stuart Isaac, Salong Chun, Pete Pin and Charles Fox to talk about uh, the collaborative photo book um, on the corners of Argyll and Glenwood um, which was recently published by Catfish Books. So I hope you enjoyed the video, um, which will give you a bit of a sense of the book. Um, I'm going to read a bit about the book just to introduce it um, and introduce our speakers before handing over um, to the guys to tell you a bit more about the process of working on the book together. Um, so just to let you know as well um, that the last copies of the book have just dropped on the Catfish book site. So it's catfish.asia. If you'd like to order a pre-copy, I think they're going fast. Um, and also just to let you know that we'll be on Discord after the talk. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can drop them in there. So yeah, for a bit of background on the book to start off with, um, on, the corner, on the Corners of Argyll and Glenwood by Stuart Isaac, words by Si Long Chun and sequencing by Pete Pin. As a young graduate student in photography in the early 1990s, Stuart Isaac found himself on the corners of Argyll and Glenwood streets in Chicago, photographing Cambodian refugees who had settled on the city's north side near his apartment. Isaac entered a world which would define his practice, spending much of the next 25 years working in Southeast Asia, often returning to work on issues affecting the Cambodian diaspora. Nearly 30 years later, in collaboration with Cambodian American activist Salong Chun and Pete Pin, Pete Pin a Cambodian American photographer, Isaac revisited the Chicago work. Together, they resequenced and contextualized the series. Chun and Pin would have been young boys in the back of the room in many of Isaac's images, watching their older siblings, who were Isaac's main focus, as they struggled to adapt to life in America while burdened with the trauma of war and genocide. Sequenced by Pin with words from Chun, this book explores the complexities um, of the early, early diaspora, not only the streets, but also the tender moments of a community in transition held together by family and tra tradition. Um, so a bit of insight to the book and also now just to introduce our speakers. Um, so Stuart Isaac um, is an American photographer born in Switzerland, raised in the UK and now living in Seattle, Washington. He originally studied Southeast Asian history at university in the 1980s, focusing on Thai and Cambodian history, and moved to Thailand as an academic before becoming a photographer. 
in the early 1990s, he lived in Chicago near the city's large Southeast Asian refugee community, living near Argyle, Ar Argyle Street for over three years. Um, Isaac embedded himself as a documentary photographer in a small, tight-knit Cambodian community, then centered on the corners of Argyle Street and Glenwood Avenue. The work also took him to Cambodian communities in Long Beach and Bakersfield, California, and after 2006, back to Cambodia, where a generation of Cambodian American refugees had been deported by the United States government. Salong so Chun, born in Cambodia, five days after Vietnamese tr troops seized Phnom Penh on January 7th, 1979. Salong so is one of many Khmer refugees who settled in the United States of America. Salong so is a multimedia artist disciplined in videography, photography, audio production, graphic design, and social media strategy. As a digital, digital communications manager at Pacific Lutheran University, he serves as one of PLU's leading digital storytellers, communication strategists, and social media curators. Prior to coming to PLU, Salong so was a communications associate and a nonprofit serving immigrants and refugees at Tacoma Community House. He is also the founder of the Khmer Anti-Deportation Advocacy Group, um, a community effort that advocates, supports, and provides community members resources. Pete Bin is a photographer based in New York, um, born in the Kawidang refugee camp um, on the border of Cambodia and Thailand in 1982. Pin and his family were resettled as refugees in California in the early 1980s. His work explores themes of memory, migration, and intergenerational trauma among the Cambodian American community across the United States and among his own family in the US and Cambodia. A high school dropout, Penn is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, where he did honours and the International Centre of Photography. His photographs on the Cambodian diaspora have been featured in New York Times, Time Magazine, NPR and Vice, among others, and is in the permanent collection of the Library of Congress. Charles Fox is the photographer working on long-term questions about legacies of conflict with a particular focus on Southeast Asia. He lectures in photography and set up Catfish Books in 2019. So welcome to our four speakers. Thank you. Um, I'm really uh, looking forward to tonight's talk. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Um, thank so you. yes, I suppose I just wanted to say a bit at the beginning, um, that uh, I sort of initially um, met Charles maybe a year or two ago when we'd been in conversation for a while about doing something together. Um, and I was really excited to learn about this new publication. Um, so as with all Catfish publications, um, the book is amazing. I'll just show you it here. You can see it, or is my screen gonna cover it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, but yeah, it's an amazing book. Um, really thoughtfully designed. And um, I was really interested in the idea of um, revisiting work after a kind of period of time and also um, reframing work from multiple perspectives. Um, I think, yeah, th when reading the book, the kind of interplay of word and image was something that really struck me. Um, this idea of weaving kind of multiple narratives um, through both um, photographs and text and it's been brilliant just meeting you guys and um, hearing more about the stories behind the images. Kind of opened up um, some of these ideas even more and hopefully we'll hear some more of those stories tonight. Um, so yeah, I thought we could just start. Charles, if you wanted to give us a bit of background about Catfish um, sure. its kind of ethos and mm. process of working with photographers yeah. and particularly maybe about how this publication came about as well. Uh, I, thank you for having us, by the way. It's really great to be here at Open Eye. Hello to everyone who's come along to listen to us today. Um, this, I mean, this project does come off, off the, you know, um, a rather intense process of sequencing and putting this book together um, during lockdown. As we're all working through that. Um, and in some way, it bought some of us some time to do this. But um, Catfish really came about from... Um, I, you know, I was one of those people that was privileged enough to work in Cambodia for a long period of time. And I started working with a family in LA um, about five years ago when we put together a book called Buried about um, this family burying their pictures um, from the Khmer Rouge and 
and reviving them later. And, you know, we had conversations in Liverpool about this. You met the family, you know, and it was, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful piece of work. And when I started taking this round to publishers, um, I was asked to do strange things like, you know, why didn't you go back to the village where they were during the Khmer Rouge and then, you know, photograph everyone in the village? And it's just like, no, you, it's not going to work. You can't do that. Um, and there seemed to be a real lack of understanding, I suppose, of some of the themes and issues that were coming out of that work and, and other work that I was looking at all the time. So started off the back of that catfish and, and really to start looking at work that was coming out of Southeast Asia, um, but also work being made about the diaspora or you know photographers from the diaspora. So a really global sort of reach. Um, and one of the, we're small, you know, we'll do three books this year, Pete's being the first one we've got out. Um, and it was really about looking at Pete's, uh, sorry, Stuart's work. Sorry, Pete, there's me just hoping that you let me do something one day. Um, <laughs> we're just about getting this work out of Stuart's and uh, I've met Stuart in um, Seattle. Um, we share mutual friends and, and uh, you know, in that same trip I met Silong and, you know, and um, Silong's clothing brand red scarf revolution you know i used to see around the streets of phnom penh all the time um and then pete i met in phnom penh and i've seen his work for years and and it and it came about with stuart's work that there was this opportunity to make this book and revisit it and when pete um when stuart and i started talking it's just like you know who we need to make this a collaborative process and you know he was like silong and pete it's like well absolutely you know these guys will bring so much to this, this conversation. So we sort of worked on it over six months, um, chipping away uh, the sequencing and editing and, you know, um, Pete's really keen eye for a sequence and Stuart's experience. And then, you know, what Silong brings with words, um, which weaves through the book. And it was nice of you to mention the significance of um, Silong's words. And yeah, so that's how the book came about. Um, and another, important thing that's worth mentioning is so there was money obviously for all the guys to be paid for the book um but they all said plow it into the next book so we were able to take the work of someone like Stuart who's a really established photographer and invest it in a, a photographer from Southeast Asia um a guy called Lin Chan Soklina who I know Pete um, knows really well and you know that's going to be uh, our next book so it was this existing work about Cambodia then feeding into new work about the region so mm -hmm. that's sort of our philosophy and what and what we're trying to do yeah that's really interesting um about kind of developing that conversation on um you, I think you can see that from Buried as well um this sort of touched on some of those ideas in this publication um but yeah I thought we would um I would ask you, Stuart, um, a bit about kind of originally making the work um, 30 years mm -hmm. ago now, and kind of how you started photographing the Cambodian um, community in Chicago and um, a bit about, yeah, the process of making the work at that time. So, uh, you know, you, you explained kind of how I wound up in, as a photographer, I was an academic Southeast Asia, and then I, I moved to Chicago and I decided to enroll in a graduate photography program in a small college there, uh, Columbia College, which had one of the few MFA programs. And I was living near the Cambodian community. So um, like a lot of projects like this, you, I went to kind of a community center on Argyle Street, right near the corners was um, a temple, Buddhist temple. And from there, I met these guys who hung, uh, hung out in the corners. And so for three years, I developed as a photographer while working on my thesis, while photographing this project so the project was about me learning to be a photographer as much as it was anything else you know I was I was trying to I wanted to be a photographer but I also believed it was important to have knowledge and to kind of bring previous experience into my photography into my practice so I've always kind of described it as merging um, you know I, I had this interest in Cambodian history how was I going to tell stories? You know, you can be a writer, you can be a filmmaker, you can choose any tool you like. I chose photography. And so I started working on those corners and, and it was 
close to my house, so it was easy to work on. It was I could drop in any time. The, the homes, the people I knew there were very generous and extraordinarily open to allowing me to come in and out of their lives and photograph them. Mm -hmm. um, some of the images in the book for early on, I, I would I would think a lot of the lot of some of the better materials towards the end because my skills were getting better, you know. And I, I was taking this work into sort of critiques at my college and showing the work and, and getting feedback and developing my practice. Mm -hmm. And so that, I did that for three years. And then um, I, it pretty much wrapped up in 1994 when I got my thesis and I actually moved back to Thailand and was based in Southeast Asia and covering, actually covering, spending a lot of time in Cambodia after that, covering the it kind of end days of the civil war there. Mm -hmm. So that um, was- Thank you, sorry. I meant just thank you too. So I should have started by saying thank you for having us here. Appreciate oh, it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was the kind of start of your kind of career, I guess, at that time. Um, and the kind of long, long-term work with the Cambodian mm -hmm. community as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose I was interested as well about the decision to revisit the work and um, yeah, the kind of whether you think the, like what's the significance now, I guess, um, compared to back then, has that changed? Um, and kind of, yeah. Well, there, there, what did you kind of an old, I mean, there's an old adage in photography that, you know, we're our own worst editors mm -hmm. and you kind of get wrapped up in the work and, and you, you see it, for moments that you remember and particular memories and stuff. And I, I've obviously always worked on these images for 30 years. They, they weren't just thrown in a box, you know, they were scanned in, they were rescanned. I was constantly kind of re-editing them. And to be honest, I think I was, I couldn't edit this work by myself. It would have been a disaster. So bringing in, uh, and also just giving it some editor who doesn't know the story would have been a disaster too, I think. So I, I think it was really crucial. And when Charles came to me and said, you know, let's bring in Salong, let's bring in Pete. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and as the book describes them, they're the kids in the back of the room. They, they lived through this experience. So it, it was really fascinating for the six months we were going back and forth, listening to how they viewed these images versus what I saw in the images. And, and that process was, was essential to the creation of this book. It really was, so. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you exhibited the work in 2017, wasn't it? Um, and so long you were kind of um, involved in curating an exhibition with these images, is that right? Yes, um, I, I, I came across Stuart's work uh, a couple of years before I curated the exhibition. I was just, I just fell in love with the intimacy and the rawness of the photo, because I've never seen photos uh, taken of Cambodians in that way, because my family photos were all staged and posed and flowers. flowers. It's really, really um, manufactured, but Stuart's photo was really raw and really um, showed me um, what it really it was like looking into a mirror. and. Um, it was really interesting, interesting. And, and I curated an exhibition called Scars and Stripes in, here in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, it just, you know, detailing the plight of Cambodian refugees from being displaced by refugees to trying to resettle in America and then getting to deported Cambodia. Cambodia. So, mm -hmm. right? And then <clears throat> Stewart's work was a huge part of that where he was um, uh, taking photos of these guys. And then years later, after Stewart would take these photos, they would, they, 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 you know, uh, most, most of them was on the for deportation. So, um, and, you know, that's how Stuart and I kind of, kind of um, started beginning working together. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, the sound just seems to be breaking up a bit for me, but I hope it's all right for everyone else. Is it okay? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I think um, like you touched a bit about that kind of, well, looking back at the work, some of the things that were happening then, um, like for the Cambodian community. And um, I think like when we were discussing the work, you were mentioning that like some of the issues are still happening, like this kind of issue of deportation um, and how that's kind of affecting people's lives today as well. And I think I mentioned like in your intro about um, your work with the Khmer Anti-Deportation Advocacy Group. I was wondering if you could just tell us like a wee bit about that and kind of what's happening with that. Okay, okay. Um, let me know if I'm breaking up. I know if I can switch my headphones because I got my Bluetooth on, that could be the issue. But uh, the Khmer Anti-Deportation Group um, is a, a group of just um, local activists that got together because there was a need. In 2009, there's seven of our community members 
that was on the deportation list here in, in, in the Tacoma, Seattle area of Washington. And um, the community came together and said, well, well we, we have to do something. We can't just allow ICE to come and rip apart our communities like this. So we gathered the community get together, all, all of the folks who was interested in, in, in the work got together and we started to strategize. And then we had um, a good friend of ours, Bo Stewart and I, Manny uh, Uch, um, who was one of the first person in the deportation list. And Stewart also photographed when he was going through it. And, and uh, with his experience and guidance, uh, we were able to contact our governor here, Washington State Governor mm -hmm. Lee. And um, out of the seven that we uh, that was deported, we were able to keep four of them with their families that year. So, so it was you know small victories, but you know the loss of three of our community members was was uh, impactful deep because a lot of these. Um, the three, the three members of the community who, who were deported, you know, they were fathers that, that were the sole providers of the families. And when you uproot the, the source of income and the foundation, the whole family kind of, um, you know, breaks down and, you know, the kids, kids focus in school. So the impacts of deportation is huge. And we felt like um, we were being unfairly deport, deported. We came here as legal residents un, under, under the um, you know, the United States States 1980 Act, I think it was, and we were all legal residents while growing up. And as you can see in, in, in the book, but we didn't know that they weren't um, American citizens. We came here, thought we were American, we were accepted in the country. Um, you know, it's our new home and we accepted it as, as our new homes. And if you look at the guys that committed these crimes, when they were at this age, you know, they were young, didn't know what the future held, held them and to, and a lot of these guys and even women who are on the, um, the, the chopping block block deportation have already served their time. So just because you're not an American, American citizen, citizen, these, these, these um, community members would go to jail for 13, 14, 15 years and get out and, and wouldn't, wouldn't be free. ICE, Customs and Immigration Enforcement would pick them up and detain them indefinitely until they were deported or they could fight their case. So, um, you know, you know so I, think, I think it has... Has, um, it, it, it came out of a need and we don't want to do this work. Hopefully one day in the future, we, we won't have to do this work. So that's how the um, anti-deportation, because there was a need, there was an, an, an immediate an emergency um, need in our community and we just came together. And um, a lot of community members, a lot of folks with experience and experts came in and, and you know, and this, and we're, we're here today. Mm. Yeah, I was reading some of the stories there um, on the website and it's just shocking that like, I don't know, that as well people who have been born in um, America and like some of them maybe never even visited Cambodia, that that would be like some like some sort of logical decision to kind of interrupt people's lives like that. Like, um, so yeah. Um, thank you for telling us a bit about I that. I wanted to add a little bit, is that possible to that? Yeah, thank yeah. you, Scott. That was really, and the, you know, the, it's, it's a complicated issue, right? And, and, and the, most Americans also don't fully understand the issue itself, and, and let alone a lot of Cambodian Americans so okay. don't fully understand how complicated, you know, immigration law is. Stuff. But these laws were changed in, in the late 90s and became retroactive, meaning that, that if, if you had committed what were considered in immigration law to separate from criminal the criminal justice system in America, the two separate systems um, under immigration law was considered um, a felony. And, and again, some many felonies under immigration law are, separate, are, are not felonies under um, a deportable felony. Um, you were re-detained in effect, right? You were brought, you, you may have served your time free then, and then you were brought back into the immigration system. Um, and then, and then, you know, thrown into this process. So uh, the point being, though, you know, these are it's a different issue from the um, the deportations of undocumented immigrants, because we're talking about the deportations of legal permanent residents, LPRs, who, who are refugees, um, who came here, you know, under the legal framework of refugee status, um, and and then find themselves in a situation um, getting, you know, on this list to get deported back or having been deported. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I recommend kind of visiting the website and, and reading up about that as well. If um, if you don't know kind of what's happening, um, I suppose yeah. 
Pete, um, I wanted to talk about um, your kind of um, how you met Stuart and Stuart how you met Pete um, and how kind of so like Pete you're a, a photographer as well and um, I suppose kind of how um, your interaction with this work um, kind of started and was carried forward into your own work um, I'd be interested in hearing just a bit more about kind of your practice yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I met Stuart um, in person, face to face, actually, in um, Manny Uches. He's um, based in, 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 in the Northeast, in, in Tacoma, right? Um, around the very, Seattle. Uh, Olympia, right? Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Around Seattle. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and for his um, clemency hearings in the state of Washington, um, and that's when I first really, like, personally met, met Stuart, but I had been familiar with his work. and. Um, at, at that point, I wasn't necessarily interested in, in, in photographing yet, or wasn't really hadn't made up my mind in terms of what I, 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 I wanted to do. And um, I, I was familiar with Stuart's work, and you know, just kind of a cursory kind of search for for these images. Um, you'll land on, on on Stuart's work because the the fact of the matter is, there's really nothing else out there um, when it comes to sustained you know documentary work um, on the Cambodian American community. Um, so for me, you know, it's just, just having that, looking at these pictures from this period and, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, the familiarity of these images, um, you know, um, and just, just, just the intimacy of, of, of the photographs, um, really, really moved me. And, and I reached out to Stuart when I, I decided that I wanted to photograph and, uh, and, and that decision also was based off of my drive or need to kind of tell the story also. Um, and yes, yeah, so I reached out to Stuart actually wrote my letter of recommendation to, to ICP when I when I studied photography. And um, and I feel like there's, you know, there's a conversation that 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 I had in my work with Stuart's work. Um, you know, um, there the I mean it, it comes out of the same canon, right? That the fundamental difference obviously is 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 this insider outsider, you know? Um, but to some extent too, I also kind of empathize. With it. I also feel like an outsider when I photograph too. That's kind of part of the process. Um, but um, yeah, so I've, I've I've been photographing since 2010, 2011, um, and I've practically been photographing the exact same thing. And I'm I'm, I'm interested exclusively in in this story, um, and this 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 need for me at least to be able to tell. To have someone who's Cambodian American who lived through this experience um, be also able to have the opportunity to tell the story too. Um, so I'm I'm interested in in you know that this kind of the unique Cambodian American experience, um, and and I feel very strongly that there's so many parallels to you know to things that are happening today. There's just so many kind of really fascinating tidbits to to learn from that experience, uh, but also just think it's a compelling story to tell. Um, and I moved to do it because of, again, my own family experiences and, and my experience in the salon can, you know, can attest to this too. I mean, and, you know, Charles, um, the book Buried, I mean, this is something that a lot of Cambodians did, you know, so my family buried their only family photograph that they had um, right before the start of the war. Um, and then my uncle returned back um, to Cambodia to retrieve it in the 90s. And when I first found that photograph, I saw that photograph, I, 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 when I started this project with this, um, my, my work, I interviewed my grandmother um, about her experiences and her life. And I took a portrait of her and then I found this photograph. I didn't, never even knew it existed. Um, and it just kind of blew my mind. Um, you know, and this idea of, you know, um, of, the, of the photograph as an object of memory, but then, um, you know, how, how so much, you know, um, is seen in that this, this, this one photograph and how it also is, speaks about the absence of um, the fact that we've lost everything, you know, that every Cambodian American who um, immigrated here or was resettled here came here with nothing but the clothes on their backs and, and a bag from ICM. Um, you know, and and started their lives um, over again. Um, so the the photograph kind of brought back to me kind of the importance of, of image making, the importance of photography um, as a connection to the past, um, and as a means to open up conversations about about the past. 
Yeah, I was just thinking of your work, um, migrations of memory, and the the idea of relating to that the object. Um, so yeah, in like books like Burrage, you're looking at kind of those historical photos, but then some of the images um, in the migrations of memory series are kind of like like Polaroids of family and that idea of mapping kind of family history. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and you touched a bit on about the kind of insider out, outsider perspectives um, moving from like Stuart, your series to your work now, mm -hmm. Pete. Um, so I was wondering if you could um, all kind of talk about that a bit. Um, so I suppose, um, the process I mean, I, I, of preparation. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I'll kind of carry on what, what Pete was talking about, how, how we met and, and, but from my perspective, meeting Peter was, Pete, sorry, was actually a real revelation. Um, the Cambodian immig immig immigrants, I was photographing refugees in the early nineties were very new to the country, still very traumatized by their experience living in poverty. I mean, this country was, completely unprepared for the influx of Southeast Asian refugees in the 80s and 90s. There was very few resources provided. And so they were struggling. And so when I met Pete, flash forward, flash forward 20 years, five years, you know, he was this guy who went to Berkeley and was getting into photography. And it was a real revelation that there'd been this kind of generational shift. Um, and it's reflected in the, um, the feedback we've been getting from the book has actually been a little overwhelming. Even this morning, we were getting more feedback from people within the community who are just hearing about this book. And, you know, as I was, uh, you know, you're a little worried when you've, you've done something like this, that, you know, and in 25 years, you put it out, it's like well, 30 years later, you know, what's the reaction going to be? And it's been a really overwhelming because I, th I think there's a generation of Cambodian Americans now who are, who, who are breaking out of that experience. And, and it's 25 years, it's a generational shift and are looking at this work and are able to place themselves in it. And, it, and it's been really amazing for me to, to know that this made that connection with people. And, and they're, they're, even people who didn't, you know, this is the corners of Argyle and Glenwood. It's, it's you know, there, there are dozens of these Cambodian communities in the nineties all around America and Long Beach and East Coast, West Coast. So it wasn't like the largest of any of these communities by any stretch, but I think the experience, and Peter's talked about this, was was kind of universal. So it, the feedback for me, and and seeing Pete and Salong engage with the work, was very rewarding for me. It really was. And, and I don't, you know, thirty years ago when I did show this work, or I gave, you know, I was always giving these guys prints. I I think their reaction to it would have been very different. You know, they they just didn't have the historical perspective back then, probably to to mm -hmm. see what was what they were going through. Yeah, and 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 add to that, I think um, um if we were to present this work earlier. Earlier, what happened was with 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 eyes that look like these in the streets, and you know, um, um, being charged for crimes, um, um, you know, they were they were seen as criminals, and when you're seen as a criminal, it dehumanizes. Yeah. What this book does is humanize these folks. Um, not even even in the you know in others community in our community as well. Um, when a lot, a lot of guys was first deported and went back to Cambodia, they were looked down upon in Cambodia too because the Cambodians always saw them, saw them oh, as oh, you're you in the United States, States. You have an opportunity to better your life and you messed that up and now you're deported back. Why, we should, why, we should, why should we care about you? And, and uh, just, just, you know, just that um, mentality was very, very prevalent in Cambodia and even here. When you were up in the criminal justice system here in the Cambodian community, you know, families didn't like to talk about it. You feel ashamed, right? It's not nothing, not anything to be proud of. So what this this book does is also also a nice experience. Mm -hmm. It's been really interesting, actually, to picking up on Stuart was said about um, the feedback and the conversations. It's like with Silong's words, you know, like when it was weaved through the sequence, someone wrote to me the other day and said, you know, it's like Silong's writing like this love letter to his community, you know, this memory of the community. Um, and comments like that keep coming through, you know, I'm sure Silong, you're, you're getting this all the time, right? You know, these sort of comments now, you've, 
you've been getting a lot of hits, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fortunate and blessed, man. man. <laughs> Very humble. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what you were saying about um, that kind of the 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 kind of thirty year gap is is really significant, and kind of having that perspective to be able to look back. Um, on the work with a kind of a bit of distance as well um, but yeah I was interested in because this, the whole selection um, is over a hundred images I think isn't it and you kind of narrowed together you narrowed that down to about 20 or 30 images so I was kind of interested in um, yeah the kind of multiple perspectives and what stories you each kind of wanted to tell um, when you were selecting which images would go in, into the book. Would you like me to start? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I mean, I, hopefully you can pull up the image. So, yeah. the, you know, this is also the classic case of edit photographers being their own worst editors. Um, you know, the, the, the image I selected, you know, is the most important image to me and I wanted is the final image actually. It's a picture of Gino being hugged by his mom after we'd just driven back from California, actually bringing his mom and his dad on a, on a very long road trip. Yeah, that one right there. Yeah. And they were, they were having a celebration in Chicago and Gino's and the guys were hanging out and his mom came out and gave him this big hug. But, you know, the reason it's an important image is because is here you have Gino's mom you kind of dressed the traditional Khmer style with the sarong and the the shirt and G and Gino's obviously in his streetwear, and so this this what, what you know the 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 Khmer title of the book is is family and and it's not just about obviously about the family Gino and his mom it's about these kind of new relationships and these new friendships and new families that are formed out on the streets as well, and so this picture to me it's it's about this this kind of generational it's the spread and it's also the connection. You know, what, what made Gino such a fascinating person was that, you know, he had to flee Bakersfield, California because of the violence and the gang problems. Um, numerous friends of his were, were, were injured and killed. It was really kind of tragic. But so, you know, he has this kind of tough exterior, but he was actually one of the most kindest and generous and loving people I've ever met. And that's because of his mother. His mother was just very, a very warm, generous person. So for me, that image, kind it, it shows, you know, you can have this separation, but there was also this connection, you know, the family still held together and it was really important. Yeah. Um, and so long, which image did you want to look at? Um, just describe. Um, yeah, um, I, I originally said the one with the dance one, but I want to talk about the one with the baby in the bucket in, in the back. Yeah, yeah. Let me just, yes. um, I think I might have to. Because the other one's cool, but this one I want to talk about how um, culturally important the bucket in the bathtub is for Cambodians. <laughs> I think uh, I, I sent it in the chat as well. Sorry, sorry to change it up at last minute. minute. No, no worries. Um, <laughs> it was taking a while for me to download, so I think it's just easier uh, for me to pull it up uh, here. Okay, <laughs> I can also. Maybe, okay. Because yeah, uh, image number like... five. That's it. Sorry. Oh, no, it's my fault. Uh, yeah. There oh, there it is. Yeah, I want, yeah, I want to talk a bit about this. About this. I think uh, when, when uh, so what's, what's the, Stuart mentioned that if he was to do this book, he wouldn't have picked this one. But this one is significant. And I was really drawn to it because we noticed um, the baby in the bucket, which is really common in how Cambodians oh, yeah. make um, they're, you know, living in the village out there, out there but there's no, no uh, running water. So uh, my experience with the bathtub, like I spent like, like the first four or five years of my life in a bucket, just like this one in a bathtub. And I just wanted to mention it. That's what, um, you know, our parents, parents were used, used to. And the funny thing is, is that, when, you know, when we finally moved into a house with a shower, um, my my parents and still didn't shower. shower. Still didn't shower for the longest time. I didn't. I didn't. No, I didn't no. shower. All I knew how to do was, was scoop water into my head. And um, I think this, this shows uh, the progress of our community, where we where we started, and where we came from. Um, I I I just I just love this picture. Picture. 
such a lovely image with the <laughs> two sisters just yeah looking after the baby. yeah well, well yeah I, well, one thing I think I too I talked to Stuart about yesterday that if you look at the the ages of the children they're so young and they're so independent and they they, they know how to take care of each other whereas um I have children these days about the same age that, that are not as <laughs> I guess. There's a lot more, more soil than uh, um, it just speaks to me how quickly we had to grow up, how quickly we had to adapt, how quickly we had to figure out how to survive in this 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 new world. Mm, yeah. Um, I'll just stop sharing and Pete will look at look at the image as well that you wanted to talk about. I'm just gonna flex for you. I think it's actually the first image in the book, yeah. Yeah, it's the first image in the book, and and I I so this um it's not for me it's not visually the you know my favorite photographically but thematically um it 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 speaks a lot to me um out of my own personal interest too and then also my own kind of experiences but I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm interested in kind of generationally how we experienced you know, um, our lives in America and how um, my grandparents, you know, um, their Cambodian American story is fundamentally different from mine. Um, and, you know, so this photograph for me, it kind of, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a literal barrier, right, between, uh, between two different, you know, very different places um, and two very different experiences, right? So on the bottom, you have, um, you have the street, the corner, right? Um, and then, you know, on the balcony, um, you have, you know, um, domestic home cooking or, you know, and, and, and that's, that's how, I mean, that's, that's how you, you prep food and you cooked, right? You, you, you did it on, on like a day on like a mat on the ground and that's how you ate and stuff. Um, but, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in that and, and, and how, again, you know, um, my experience is so different and so radically different to the point where I can't even be in conversation with my grandparents, you know, about um, what it was like to grow up here or how high school was or her, you know, all the, 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 the fundamentally different things. Um, and, and that speaks to this larger kind of broader um, history of, of, you know, this, this, this sense of like almost a, a severance generationally of, of experiences right so you know my my you know being born I was born like like so long I was born in the camps um but but I grew up my entire life here um you know and I had no no idea what what Cambodia was as a kid I just knew it was there there's some place that we came from that we were Khmer you know um and 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 this is who we were but then we're here in america and this whole nother world and but i had no context of what that was right there was the war and then and then here we are right and and what my life what my my parents and my grandparents lives were like in, in cambodia um and vice versa and, and you know so there's this language barrier there's a generational barrier there's a cultural barrier um that 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 you know i grew up with personally that that i i yeah, that was I my I was drawn to this photograph because yeah. And you were saying a bit about um like your yeah, your immediate family, your your blood relations, but also your family who are your friends, um and those completely contrasting experiences. Um but yeah, that's a brilliant image and uh, kind of illustrates that. Um so yeah, um, thank you for kind of sharing your perspectives of about about those images. I guess um, I think um, I was interested in um, something that you've kind of already touched on that idea of the loss of image and re remembering. Um, so you speak spoke about like buried photographs and now this kind of. Um, process of re-remembering and the importance of this series and that it documents like a period of time where there's not a lot of documentation photographically um, outside of kind of personal family photos. Um, so yeah, interested in this idea of kind of the reclaiming of like identity. Um, and I was wondering if um, you could speak a bit about that. Um, 
I know so long uh, some of your kind of ideas around that when we when we first spoke were really interesting. Yeah, I just want to say how important the work of Stuart is for um, our community because um, I'm part of photographs photograph you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, our families before the Khmer Rouge came and took over the village, village the city, they would bury all of their values and belongings. And along with those valuables and belongings, was, um, you know, photo, photographs, those memories, and a lot, a lot of that lost. Um, unfortunate. I, I have no idea how my parents were able to save a lot of the photos that we do have. I have photos of myself as a baby, baby and us arriving to America, which is a luxury, right? A, a lot of Cambodian families, like my wife's family, family don't have that. Um, uh, so, so to see Stuart's work, that, that, um, it's kind of an outsider type, 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 type uh, you know, the photography. It's it's really impactful for me because most of our, like our family photos was with a photo and uh, you know, we're supposed to look our best that, where this is more raw. Mm -hmm. um, I just love the intimacy of it and, and, and it speaks to me, and I'm very grateful for this body of work because without it, we wouldn't see this, right? We would just see these, see them as they are today. Um, they're, you know, they're uh, they were formerly incarcerated, committed crimes when they were younger, and now they're just rebuilding their lives. But to be able to sort of see that and see how human they are, how family oriented they were, and how close and tight knit the community was in in, in um and and. and a point of their life where it was so hard to struggle and adapt, trying to find out who you are as a person, what does it mean to be Cambodian, what does it mean to be Cambodian America, and, and just seeing that struggle because um, a good example of that, if you look at the photo um, in the book, what I, I what stood out to me, I, I just recently noticed that all the guys, if you look around the around the neck, yeah, it's, it's, it's very Cambodian. Um, one of us has have um, um, culturally just, just wear a gold necklace with a a Buddhist uh, thing on it, and then and, and just to see the fashion mesh mesh with the snapbacks and the shoes, shoes and the baggy pants. Um, that's just that's just how I grew up too. And, and you know, you know, like uh, Stuart mentioned earlier, early, um, you know, this book is really a metaphor for the Cambodian community all over all over the United States. Can I chime in with something that uh, Silong said before? So I, I had to just wrote down so. Silong so said before, they said, uh, we are proof that the Khmer Rouge failed. And, and I don't know if a lot of viewers here, they, I'm sure they, they know about this bit of history, but there was a particular, there's a particular uniqueness to the Cambodian genocide and the way the Khmer Rouge conducted it. And there's this concept of year zero they created, which was basically 1975, April 17th, when the Khmer Rouge took over, all history ended, all culture was wiped out. The elite were gonna be eradicated the artists, the intelligentsia, they were just gonna be eliminated, eradicated, and we're gonna start from year zero and, and no history. And so this constantly comes up in the themes so when people talk, come about, particularly with Ceylon and Peter, is, is about history. And you know, how the Khmer Rouge failed. I mean, and ultimately this kind of utopian thinking is, is it, 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 culture will always burst through will always fight through it. It's always going to be stronger than this kind of these kind of political systems. And, the, you know, as Ceylon said it best, he said, you know, him, Pete, the rest of them and Cambodians, it's thriving in Cambodia now. They are proof that the Khmer Rouge failed. Yeah, that's really lovely words. Um, I was wondering just begin of, of that, could you tell us about um, the culture? It's bursting through now, um, like some of the Cambodian artists maybe like. Um, also, um, Reyes Garf Revolution, so long, if you wanted to chat to us about that a bit, <laughs> it would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. Our, 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 our revolution is a clothing brand I started uh, several years ago, just, just for me. And my group of friends to have something somewhere that, you know, identifies who we are, so, something to have pride in, it's something, something to say, you know, we, we're Cambodian American. American. Um, I grew up heavily, uh, you know, um, entrenched in the hip hop culture, I also skated, skated so, so the streets, if you look at, look at the images, I mean, we, the streets from this book, but it's very similar to the street where today, and um, I, 
I, I just took that concept and, and what I grew up around and I took these Cambodian cultural images and just designed them in a way where I think, where I thought it was more, more appealing to our youth. Because the, really the goal of the clothing brand is to, to provide a bridge for the upcoming generation to the past. Um, not, not necessarily the great on the wood past, but more of the Khmer Rouge past and why, why we were placed and why we were here. And um, um, that clothing brand really became, became a platform where, where it became a platform of uh, amplifying voices, amplifying our stories, uh, bridge, bridge generational gap. And, and um, I'm really just um, speaking out because, you know, during the Khmer Rouge, all the arts and theaters and music was suppressed press and, and taken, taken away. away. And like the like said, said the, really the mission, the goal for Red Scarf Revolution is to bring that all back and reclaim our Red Scarf, which is part of our culture, culture for such a long time before the Khmer Rouge co-opted it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and then with Red Scarf Revolution, I was able to run into Charles Fox's work and Stuart Stewart's work. So it's, it's, it's also it's a networking platform for me. And as you know, it's been very, very cool. Yeah. Definitely go and have a look at Red Scarf Revolution if you haven't already. Um, yeah, are there any other kind of projects or artists? Um, Monica, sorry, Monica Sock. Um, just, uh, I mean, if you want to pick up a book of incredible poetry, you know, Monica Sock and Nail, The Evening Hangs On, was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, just how it, you know, it, it's really interesting having spent time in Cambodia and, and speaking to Pete and Silong and how she navigates and weaves through this displacement and uh, it's just phenomenal work and and then there's other things you know I don't know like Cambodia has this way of letting you know it's there all the time you know I mean I live up in Sheffield and you wouldn't think like there'd be there was anything you know and I was walking down the street and there was a poster that said like Barang music and Barang means foreigner and I was like, I was saying to people, it's like Barang, like why, why are they talking about Barang here? And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and there's a there's a Cambodian lady who lives in Sheffield who runs this world music event called Barang Music. You know, like so, you know, when when things can move again, you guys need to. If anyone in the UK needs to go to a Barang Music event. Like, there's so much great stuff out there, um, not just photography. You know. The art coming out of Cambodia now is phenomenal. Lin Chan Sok Lima's work, you know, um, there's a whole range of exciting practice, you know, and when we're seeing that come out of Angkor Photo Fest as well, you know, education's emerging in photography. There's, there's such great work. What about you, Pete? What jumps out for you, mate? Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, what's really, so I'd, I'd recommend Monica. Monica's a good friend of, of, of mine and, and I, her poetry, her just the prose is just it's beautiful and um, absolutely, you know, we lost a couple of months ago, um, a really important young voice um, for Khmer Americans, um, Anthony So, who, who passed away in, in um, San Francisco, and he grew up in Stockton, where I grew up also, and his, his stories, his work was, you know, about growing up in Stockton as a, you know, Cambodian American queer, you know, um, just navigating that that entire world um and it, it you know he had a, he had a piece in the new yorker in february of, of last year that was just so beautiful and moving and, and i was so saddened by by his loss um by his passing um there aren't a lot of cambodian american visual artists which is really interesting for me and actually someone just reached out to me yesterday and said you know who's cambodian american who's um who is a visual artist and, and a curator and, and and you know just said oh i just found your work and blah 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 there's not much out there um, you know, but there's there's a lot of great in Cambodia itself. There's a long tradition of of, of visual arts, more not contemporary but more classical. Uh, but then there's an interesting kind of movement of contemporary visual arts that's coming out of Phnom Penh um, that is really really, really exciting. Um, in the states, um, a lot of it's been music. You know, sound like I said, a lot of a lot of a lot of Khmer artists um, have been musicians to hip hop and you know. Um, so it's it's in terms of visual arts. So I, I feel you know I, I'm I'm waiting for, um, yeah for for a lot more people to reach out and and just to see what's out there. I'm I'm really excited about that. Now I think there's like a really great energy in terms of this generation of of kids who are like my you know the generation you know that came after me or so like my brothers is people who just finished college now or so or so and ask some of the same questions that I was asking then. 
um, have, you know, resources or perspectives that, that kind of are, are, are phenomenal that can kind of open up, you know, a really phenomenal practice. So I'm interested in seeing that for sure. There's another one as well um, that I came across the other day, which is uh, Generation Magazine. So I, I came across these guys on Instagram. Yeah, and sure. I, I know they've put one out and, you know, they were talking about putting out some more, you know, arts and culture magazine dedicated to amplifying the voice of various identities, experiences, and, and generations of the Khmer diaspora. You know, um, and that, that was the guy that reached out to me, Michael. Yes. Was it? Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he did some, he's done that really interesting work on uh, the photographs from the camps and then the letters and the poetry, you know, um, it's just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hanging out for the next edition of Generation magazine because it's exciting stuff. Yeah, maybe we can drop some links in the Discord chat after and people can... Um, I mean, I would, I wouldn't call this, a, I don't like using the word Renaissance because it's not like Cambodian culture ever vanished. But, you know, there, there's periods of struggle. And, and so it, it, this gets back to what I've seen in the last 10 years versus before where Cambodians in the diaspora in the U.S. have just been able to take control of their own narrative. Um, you know, through film festivals, through photography, through writing, through music. And it's very different than what I saw in 1990. It's very different. Yeah. It's like when Silong like, does his um, appearance in the cam... What was the film that you were in, Silong? <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you got to take me out. <laughs> Sorry, man. I, was, I, just, it was so I recently... Good. A couple of years ago, I got an extra in a film here in Seattle, Seattle Float, which is about a Cambodian American in the 90s. Um, uh, float, he seems just to float around in life, just hanging around. And I mean, the basis, uh, the basis of the story was him trying to get a date with the local barista at the coffee because, you know, we live in Seattle. Seattle. Um, he's just trying to get a date with a local barista. Um, it, was, it was really a um, uh, in depth film where it just explores uh, a, a Cambodian guy that's in school trying to find his way and he's trying to find out as well. But, you know, the, the news, you know, he you know, experienced the, the daily racism, racism, getting made fun, fun of him by uh, other folks. And it's just a, a fun experience. Good uh, the co-director is a Cambodian woman. woman. Uh, and and it, I would, I would uh, encourage everyone to check it out. It's called Float Film. If you just Google Float Film, it takes place in Seattle in the early 90s. And I, 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 I DJ, DJ. it was really easy for me because I also <laughs> DJ on the side. You're like a man of many hats, definitely. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if anyone has any questions for our speakers, you can drop them in the Discord. I was just having a wee look to see if any came in there. Um, but yeah, we're kind of nearing the end of the talk now. Just to finish off, um, I just wondered um, if we could talk a bit about just the responses to the book. Um, I hear it's really taken off. Um, and yeah, you kind of had to stop sales, I think, at one point. Um, so also, yeah, responses to the book and also what um, you guys want people to take away from the book. I mean, for me, as the photographer, it's, um, you know, I got this, uh, I'll read it out to you. So I got, the, I got a text this morning from literally 15 minutes before we started. So it's from uh, uh, a relative of some of the kid, the kid, uh, Jojo, um, Mark in the picture. And, and he is, I, I can't find it right now, but he's basically talking about how they found this on the internet and they were showing it to you. And he says, all the Cambodians in the room were crying. And a, 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 what he was describing was was how he just felt like this their lives were they didn't realize how important their lives were and to me what the my photographs and the reason I did this is because you know, you're talking about a relatively small country at the you know it used to be seven million population now it's sixteen uh, but it's it's a small country and but I it it it, it pictures very large in America's failed history and and it's a it's an important moral lesson for on many from many levels for americans in terms of the conduct of foreign policy um in terms of what khmer rouge did and it, i think they just the the reaction to me from that is is, is really kind of overwhelming because to see people saying 
you know, it mattered. You know, we we went through this experience and it mattered. And it's very, it's very flattering because this is not why at the time when I was doing this, this is not obviously the reaction you're getting. Um, this is not the feedback you were getting from people. And it, and it took 25, 30 years for it to get to that point where people looked at the images and just said, you know, this, this was a matter. And that, and that's, as a photographer, that's very, very satisfying. You know, even if, you know, as if I told people, the way Charles structured the book is that it's small, it's very affordable. It's not some $50 coffee table book. It's accessible. This was real. This was all part of the process that made this work work. Um, so, you know, I, I'll just be forever grateful that the, you know, it's just important personally for it's just very rewarding to know that I did something that mattered to people and, you know, beyond, beyond whatever my goals were back then, it's very rewarding. So. Yeah, uh, for me, the, uh, what I would like folks to take away from the book is um, um, just understanding um, the plight of the Cambodian, Cambodian American refugees, not just uh, uh, really just every immigrant or ref and refugee that comes here as a new citizen or a new resident, that there's a lot of challenges and struggles, and struggles we go through, but despite all of those challenges, they, there's a lot of happiness, and there's a lot of family, there's a lot of love uh, with, within this, this community. And, um, and all we want to be is accepted. So hopefully um, to uh, be able to accept something or some a group of folks, you have to understand them. So hopefully this book will provide you understanding and insight and reason to, to, to uh, you know, to allow some for uh, refugees and immigrants, not just for, for our community, but for all of the communities. Um, I, I wanted to touch on on what, what Stuart said also in terms of um, you know the, the the time frame and and, and how it's being um, received now. I just find it, yeah, I think the response um, is is kind of amazing, and I think there's a deep there's a real hunger for for this, you know, um, and and I think part of it too. One is uh, given the absence of, of of many narratives about the the Khmer American experience, um, but then also I think there's some sense of validation. Right of you know that 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 you know um, of this experience um, in my in my own work and um, in my practice um, you know I used to, I, I did these workshops where I had young people go out and find kind of ephemera and photograph the ephemera and made Polaroids so they they made it ephemera out of ephemera um, but the the point being the kind of taking a step back and understanding that that your story and your family story is important. And it's something that you take ownership of and 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 should be proud of and 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 should be able to tell, right? Um, and it's it's growing up in, in the context of, you know, in, in, in like an apartment complex or or in the city where everyone is Kamai, that you that's in your circle and everyone's gone through the exact same experience, it's easy to walk out of that or or see in that that you're not that special, everyone's like, you know, um, but the reality is that that it's exceptional, right? That those experiences that people live through are, are exceptional. So I think at least for the Cambodian Americans or young Cambodian Americans who are, 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 pro, are finding this work for the first time, you know, that's what I want the, the biggest takeaway, right? That, that your story is important, your family story is important um, and that you should also take ownership of that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think we're kind of drawn to a close now. Um, and yeah, we've kind of reached the hour. Um, but we will be on um, Discord if you do have any questions um, for, for our speakers um, for yeah, about 20 minutes after the talk. Um, so you can drop them in our open rooms chat. Um, and just to remind people as well that you can get a copy or pre-order the book on um, catfish.asia um, if you'd like to. Um, so yeah, just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, it's been thank great. You. Really enjoyed chatting to you, learn more about yeah making this book and um, yeah, it's a great book. Go and buy it. <laughs> So yeah, we'll jump on Discord now. Um, <laughs> okay. And yeah, we'll see you later. Thanks to everybody who tuned in for the talk. Thanks for having us so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye.